Thanks for being here tonight for our first Must See Monday event of the semester. This is a good crowd. Thank you all for being here. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Melanie Asp Alvarez, and I am the executive producer for Cronkite Newswatch up in the penthouse of the Cronkite School. And I'm also a lecturer here at the Cronkite School. And on behalf of the entire school, I'd like to welcome the women of Arizona TV News here tonight. So thank you for being here. <laughs> Joining me tonight are Catherine Anaya from CBS 5 News, Lynn Cooney from 12 News, Carrie Pena from 3TV, and Linda Williams from Fox 10. So thank you, ladies. These are the female faces that bring you the news to the 13th largest media market in the country. These are some very powerful women, and we thank them for taking time out of their busy schedule for being here tonight. And we also thank you. Um, just remember, you're encouraged, if you're talking through social media, use hashtag CronkMSM, because we all know social media is taking over the world. Um, so use that in your discussions tonight, and uh, I guess we'll get started. Okay. Kronk MSM. Okay. It's on the, on the billboard right behind us, oh, too. Okay. Cronkite Must See Monday. Oh, All right. So everybody's going to be tweeting up here. <laughs> we'll get some, I should have brought my phone. All right. Um, traditionally, we start with a question of our special guest background, career history. Um, but I kind of thought I'd change it up a little bit okay, because you all, you all have been in the business for a very long time. Not a very long time, but a long time. You've been doing this. You've been building up your careers. And sometimes, you know, you might kind of get a feeling a little rundown about what you're doing and, you know, nose to the grindstone every single day. You're out there every single day. But there's got to be something that really drives you, like a moment that happened even recently that really made you feel, God, I, I am really lucky or proud to be doing the job that I am doing as, an, as a news anchor in this market. So let's just talk about maybe some of those moments that have happened for you. Who do you want to take Anybody. Well, I would say it was Yarnell Hill, um, Channel 12 sent all of us up there, basically. We just kind of rotated, but Mark and I were up there for three or four days, and um, ended up doing a special and staying an extra day so we could do the 4th of July celebration that Prescott was holding, which seemed out of character for the town, but was actually a healing experience for them because they did use it as a memorial to honor the 19 who died. And you know that you're doing a public service when you put news on the air that people need to know there's a rapist in your neighborhood. There's flooding. Don't try to go on that street. But when you're up there and you see a whole community grieving and um, needing to be supported, and you're the conduit that shows them how much Arizona loves them. It's, it was miraculous to see how that town came together. And that was when I just, I mean, there were many nights that um, I was swallowing lumps as I'm trying to read the news, or I'm interviewing somebody and tears are coming down, because you're talking to firefighters who are sobbing at the memorial. And you just realize that your job is very important, and on some days it's more important than other days. I would agree with her, definitely. That was probably the most recent example of why we do what we do. And being up there, especially for two days that I was there um, during the memorial service and, and hearing from the people in Yarnell, um, Prescott, you know, the people from Yarnell who came to the memorial service, but family members, friends um, who just stopped us wherever we went because um, I'm not just talking about at the actual grounds, but when we were at the, the memorial sites or when we were, were even just having dinner and expressing their appreciation for the fact that we were not only there, but we were really um, telling their stories and telling of their heartache and their grieving um, with a sympathetic and compassionate um, point of view that I don't think you necessarily get to see on a regular basis when we're talking about just the usual um, news that you hear every day. And so we were able to come at it from a different point of view, but it was very, very difficult, as Lynn Sue said, it was very difficult to contain ourselves. And I think that's one of the toughest things. Um, but at that particular moment, I think we were also allowed to be human, and people appreciated that. Yeah. Um, as long as we're talking about Yarnell, um, I, I feel absolutely the same way. I was touched that um, I spent a lot of time with the Yarnell evacuees in Wickenburg 
I didn't get to Prescott to believe it or not two weeks ago. That's the first time I was in Prescott since this happened. But they kind of expect us to be the insensitive, brutish reporters that you see on TV. You know, like in Die Hard, the guy, <laughs> that guy, they kind of think we're going to be the, how do you feel, blah, 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 run over there. And when we got up there and we could cry with them and grieve with them and we weren't afraid to hug them and rock them and tell them that we, you know, what can we do, how can we help you, I think we all got a better understanding and they got a better understanding of who we are. One moment that happened, and this, this isn't Yarnell, but Richard Sines, and this has nothing to do with the Granite Mountain hotshots, but he came to me maybe about six months ago and said, hey, somebody mentioned you in an article in um, the magazine that ASU puts out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, really? First I'm like, uh-oh. But then I'm like, oh, really, what is it? It is a woman, an African-American woman, who was a student here and had graduated and is now an anchor in, I think, Atlanta. And she mentioned that, that while at school here, I was one of her oh, inspirations. Yeah. And I didn't know her, never met her. So for her to have gone to this school, got her degree, she's now an anchor, I think she's, she's in her late 20s, and to have said, when I was growing up, I would watch Linda Williams on TV mm -hmm. and say, I think I can do that. To you know, that just blew me away. I thought, oh my gosh, that's what that's what I'm here for. I think that's, that's what one I'm of here the most for. Important things we we do in our role, and that is to be here talking to you and serving as hopefully motivation, but inspiration, and letting you know that it is possible. Mm -hmm. Well, and I just think you know that the Yarnell story. It just is indicative of the bigger picture of a lot of these stories. I was at a party last weekend, and this, uh, this cool girl says to me, she says, you know, I feel like there's a lot more bad in this world than there is good. And she said, you, you probably feel that way because you do the news. And I thought about it a lot, and I thought, actually, I feel pretty much the opposite of that. Because every big story that we all cover, Yarnell's a great example, it, is, it breaks your heart and, and you want to ask why and all these things that's natural, right, and when something horrendous happens. But the beauty of the human spirit constantly overwhelms me and it really reminds me that there, for every evil doer, there's twice as many, three times as many amazing people who are willing to step in. And I think that's, for me, because I have little babies now, I just, um, I'm a relatively new mom, and you know, you ask yourself as young women, you ask yourself, because I went here and obviously, and I really busted my butt. I wanted to work on the air. I wanted to make my dreams come true. And then you think, well, do I want to work? Do I want to continue? But these are the things that for me make it all so worthwhile because you really get to see the beauty of the human spirit through this all. And that's actually a nice transition. The Cronkite School is 70% female enrollment right now. Mark Lodato just told me that. So, but we're, we're very well balanced in this audience tonight. But um, as oh, the- ladies. Go ladies. <laughs> um, but what do you see as the opportunities and obstacles for young women as they enter the world of professional journalism? The guys are loving that it's 70% women, right? <laughs> well, the obstacles for women, um, the big, biggest obstacles for women aren't going to change. It's going to be balancing your career with your family. It is a total juggling act. And it isn't just for journalists. It's for a woman who's a high-powered attorney, a woman who is a physician. A yeah, a woman who's a physician on call. And it's for you know the mom who works uh, two jobs at the shoe store and something else. I mean, just, it doesn't matter what you do. If you have um, a career or a job that's very demanding and long hours and you want to have children, you're going to face that. It is a juggling act because um, most husbands aren't stay at home, and so you are the, the primary caretaker at home, and you're the, you know, you're out there slugging it out in the workforce. So that, to me, I think is still the biggest challenge you guys might have. Well, I just read Barbara Walter's book, and she talked about how when she was early in her career, she thought there's no way you can have it all. And that really changed when she became a mother, but more so, she was saying recently, when she looked back on the early parts of her career as a mother and realized how many sacrifices she had to make. Um, and where she felt like there were always imbalances, 
And I think that we've all collectively gotten a little better about finding ways to cut corners and making those balances work. Um, I know Lynn Sue was a trendsetter in this department because she's been going home for dinner um, for as long as I can remember. And that always seemed like it was a perk of the job that wasn't ever something that I could attain. And one day, um, this was about six years ago, I decided that, you know what, my kids are at an age where I really need to be involved. I can't just be the person that you know drops them off at school in the morning and then I go to work and I don't see them again until the next morning. And so just one day I just decided on Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm going home for dinner. I didn't ask for anybody's permission, but it's common knowledge that's what I do and nobody has ever told me I can't. Everybody always works around it. So I think that when you're willing to go that extra mile to make these things happen, um, I think more so now than before, people are willing to bend over backwards to help you out because really, the happier you are in your personal life, the happier you, happier you, happier you are in your professional life and that's where you find that balance. Well, and I think, I want to just send the message to you guys today that I was sitting here um, and I remember thinking, you know, I had an internship at Channel 3 and so many people were saying, ah, you're not going to be able to get a job there. It's just not possible. It's, you're going to have to go to a small market. And, you know, everyone has their own path, right? You have to map out your path and how you want to achieve that path. I can tell you that I have found this career path to be exciting, interesting, challenging man or woman, I think it is an amazing career field. The other thing I think is that people are talking so much today about what is the future of broadcasting? Is it a legitimate career? Yes, it is absolutely. It's just evolving with social media, right? So we're agile in how we evolve with it. You guys saw, I was so impressed. Linda and Lin Su were tweeting when I walked up. I thought, all right, <laughs> ladies, right? Game on. So I just think that, um, you know, one of the things I like about coming down here is really to reinforce the positivity for all of you guys and tell you that you are on a path that is interesting because it can take you in so many different directions and it is, has been such a blessing for me in my life. And there will be people along your path who will tell you for whatever reason. And I mean from like, oh, your eyes are too close together to, oh, you'll have to go to a smaller market. No, I'm president. He's a Never make it in this business. Your eyes are too close together. <laughs> His name's Peter Van Sant, and he is now a mm -hmm. national correspondent. You probably recognize. I don't think they are. <laughs> and, what'd you say? I don't think they are. <laughs> They're too close together. I don't think your eyes are too close together. Go for it. <laughs> and look where he is. People will say the craziest things as you go through this journey, and it is your job to say, oh, We'll, we'll see about that and just move on to the next step. Don't let anyone, A, steal your joy, and B, steal your passion and your determination to make it in this business if that's what you want. Because if any of us had listened, I mean, the stuff we've heard, I, we could write a book. It would make you mad too, but I could write a book. If we had listened and stopped and paused and said, oh, instead I'm going to go into computers like my father wants me to, then we wouldn't be sitting here giving and, you sage and advice. Every, and not every job is on camera. You guys may get out there and go, you know, enough with the hairspray and the stuff that you have to do, because that's a whole nother side. We have lots of producers who started out as reporters. Right. Amen. And, lots of, <laughs> and there are lots of on-air people who decide it's more fun to do the writing off camera. I don't want to deal with that other stuff. Or they go, you know, into um, management. Exactly, or radio or print because they don't want to have to deal with, you know, standing outside in 120 degrees with or makeup on. Or in the on. rain, like I <laughs> yeah, did it yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there's every, you know, there's plenty of room in journalism. It's all encompassing for you to find your niche and to move within it. And, and make your passion. Everyone says, Linda, why, I've been there 32 years in October. Why are you still there? How can you? do this, what, you know what, my nugget at the end of the day is that I love to write. Because the jazz of being on TV, yep. it goes away. It, it can't, it just, it, the jazz, oh my God, I'm on TV. I mean, it's there for a while, but it does go away. Find something else that will sustain you, some other passion. For me, bottom line, at the end of the day, as long as I got to write, 
I'm a happy camper. I'm with you on that. Yeah, so all the BS and all the politics and all that, because that will drive you away unless you've got that thing to hold on to. For me, it's writing. Still, after all these years, I can't believe it. I, I love it. I actually started out wanting to be a print reporter, and I wrote so did uh, I. for the college newspaper all four years, and that was my goal until somewhere halfway through college, somebody said, did you ever think about broadcasting as a career? And I actually just ran into my editor um, over the weekend, and I was uh, telling him that story about how I tell students all the time about that, and he said, that was only because you couldn't write. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny. I yeah. said, I still write. True. No. Um, but yeah, you know, you just never know where that inspiration is going to come from. But it actually turned out it was an editor in my, in my news department when I was writing for the newspaper that said, you know, you should really think about broadcasting. And for the reasons that Linda mentioned earlier are the reasons that I didn't. Because when I was growing up, nobody on TV reflected me and who I was and where I came from. So the fact that we are able to bring diversity to TV is huge because there's a little girl somewhere who turns on the TV and sees one of us and thinks, you know what, she looks like me. And if she can do it, I can do it. We've done our job. Oh, when I started, there were no women on TV, hardly. And there certainly weren't women who were minorities on TV. So um, it was, I didn't need to listen to people who said you couldn't do it. You can do it. You, it's not brain surgery. That I couldn't do. <laughs> Hold someone's life in my hands. But this, anybody who, if you were a wordsmith, you know, you're talking about the writing, that's what it, journalism is. It's telling a story, if you're really good with your words, without the pictures. And then in TV, we're lucky because we get these amazing pictures. So it is. It just jumps out at you. It's a beautiful marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Harkening back to the Daily Trojan, yes. where you and I both worked. Yes. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, some of the lessons that you learned from your college days that still stick with you. Do you remember, do you remember those times and what you were told then? And, or maybe something has totally turned around. I don't know. You mean um, like tequila lessons? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lessons After I can After the newscast. <laughs> well, actually. The bulk of my lessons came from my internships. And I can't stress enough how important internships are to your future. Because this is where you, number one, you learn truly hands-on um, what the job entails. You experience it on a professional level so you know, is this truly what I want to be doing? Do I really want to be a reporter? Or maybe I want to be a producer. Um, but you also make these amazing contacts. And I remember. Um, one of my internships, one of the producers um, let me write for the newscast. And it's a union shop, so you're not allowed to write unless you're a writer. So what he was allowing me to do was phenomenal. And I was so grateful. And I, I kept telling him repeatedly, you know, I, I really appreciate you doing this. And he said, um, one of the things I want you to remember, and I always have, is he said, when you think you know everything there is to know about this business, it's time for you to get out because there is always room to learn and be a sponge and improve your craft. So even 23 years later for me, you know, you still approach the job thinking, how can I deliver this newscast or do this particular story better than I did the last one? I remember I hired myself at Channel 3. I don't know if Phil Alvidrez and them are upstairs right now. I know they're here a lot. But Phil Alvidrez was, I don't know if you guys know him, but um, he was our former news director. And so I had an internship, and I was bound and determined to get that job. I was figuring out. I would go there in the morning. I had comm lot 815, brutal. And I would, I would go to Channel 3 at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I would intern and just ask whatever I could be doing. And Patty Kirkpatrick had said to me, she's like, what the hell, do you work here? Are you an intern? Who are you? What are you doing? And so I thought, OK, I'm on the right path. So I'm, I'm doing something. So I remember they had a job. And this is interesting, guys, because figure out where your jobs are available, whether it's broadcasting or fi figure out what is on the table. What are the possibilities for you? And I knew they had a writing job coming up. And I had my eyes on that job. So I was interning. So the produ Margaret Beardsley, our executive producer, said, well, maybe you could interview for the writing job. And I said, great. OK, so I blew off Com Law. They were doing the interviews that day. And so I went in, and I did the official test and all that stuff. 
And then she brings me into Phil Alvarez's job into his office, and I said, Phil, I'm so excited, and thank you so much for hiring me for this position. I'm really excited. I can't wait to start. And so Margaret walks in like 15 minutes later, and he goes, great, I'm so glad you hired Carrie. Let's get her started. I was the first person of the day to be interviewed. We walked out. She goes, did you just hire yourself? <laughs> so I thought, OK, perfect, bullseye for me. So that was how I started. I love that. That's, that's a great, because Phil Alvedris gave me my start as well. Isn't that he something? Did. He was at Channel 10, and he was the news director. And I was the editor, tape editor, who constantly kept saying to him, you know, I can write. I can write. Look at my tape. I can write. Finally, they looked at my tape, and they're like, whoa, this is better than the story that actually aired that day because of your writing. So I didn't have anything. I didn't have the look. I didn't have the hair. I, didn't, I mean, I had anything. I was just, you know, the raw deal who could write. And they said, we're going to give you a shot based strictly on your writing. Very you know, and, and the rest of the stuff, stuff you figure it out. Because you know? <laughs> I was like, I can't put that stuff on my eyes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it while I'm driving, you know, 55 months. No, not really. But it is, um, it, it's a process. I learned a lot going to Arizona State University. Um, I learned, and it, all of the stuff that I learned in the classes, the calm law, the writing, I, I don't think I retained any of that, but I learned uh, how to deal with <laughs> Sorry, I, you know, I really they didn't. Honesty. No, I, yeah, I'm being honest, no, but I learned how to deal with aren't in a book. Learned how to interview people. Mm -hmm. I learned how to speak in front of groups of people. Um, I learned what my passion was. I learned intuition. I learned all those things that are intangible. You know, I, I think there's value in that as well. Well, because if you figure out what your passion is, boy, that makes your life so much happier. Yeah. It just yeah. really does. In college, I would say the thing I learned most was um, somebody told me to be yourself. And I didn't know what that meant. But I do now. At the time, I didn't. I do now. And it's what I tell students who come and ask me. I say, don't look at somebody and go, I want to be like her and copy her. It is the worst thing you can do. Even if you admire someone as a journalist, you don't want to be a clone. You don't be want, yeah, don't copy their style because you will look like a fake. You will be a phony because you're putting a facade on, you're acting. What you want to do is just be yourself. If somebody on the set tells a, loud, a joke and you are a loud laugher and you snort, laugh and snort. That's who you are. That separates you from mm -hmm. the pack. And that's exactly, <laughs> people at home are going to go, she is so real. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Yeah. You just, you just have to be yourself. Don't try to copy anyone. Well, TV is very transparent. And so if you are an actor and if you are pretending to be somebody you're not, somebody's going to figure it out eventually. Um, thank you, by the way, for all of you who are tweeting. Um, I just want to add on to somebody uh, tweeted one of my quotes about people will bend over backwards for you. I just want to stress that if you show wherever you are in whatever internship it is, that you are a sponge and that you are passionate about what you're doing and you're asking questions and you're in everybody's business and you're coming up and you're introducing yourself and you're saying, you know, can I interview you about your path? That's what we want to see is we want to see that fire in the belly. When we see that fire in the belly, it reminds us of, of when we started out. And we will bend over backwards to help you because we know what that's like. But if you walk into an internship and you are the person who never speaks to anybody and never asks questions, then I'm going to wonder, why are you here? So you really need to take those internships seriously because those relationships sometimes will last your entire career. And you never know who will end up being your boss one day. <laughs> Can I say one more thing? And it's just one little nugget that I wish I'd known when I was your age. Learn weather. Ah. Oh, no. now you tell me. No, I know. <laughs> now I find out. But as I have watched things progress, there's a trend now. Two fur, three fur, they hire you and they get a news person and a weather person and an entertainment person. It's just the trend and the way that TV stations appear to be going right now is they want to hire one person and get two or even three things out of it. So, you know, if, if it's between you and another person and you say, well, yes, I'm a reporter and I do weather, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> you've got the job. 
So pick up something else, be it Spanish, weather, whatever, whatever you can plow on there to put on. I pick sports weather because for women. Sports, sports for, for women. women, anything. I mean, get your basics and be a good reporter. But boy, if you can throw in that other thing, it is going to get you that job, I believe, in Fun the long run. Funny you should mention, we are exploring the dual journalism meteorology degree here wow. at ASU. Are you really? Yes, wow. it is going to be a thing. And wow. probably for the majority by the, by the majority of these, and, and a brilliant. bunch of dual degree programs that we're in, or that are in creation right now. Great. So look for that coming here at the Great. Cronkite School. Yay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. A lot of you were talking about the qualities that you like to see in interns and in people like are sitting out in the audience. Name some of the qualities, and don't be modest, some of the qualities that when you look at yourself, you think, that has projected me through all of this. And it's not just the good writer, it's not just the drive, but what are you really, when you look at yourself and what has gotten you here, what are the qualities that you think really have set you apart and given you that edge? It's interesting that you say that because my um, news director as of a week ago, um, <laughs> yes, one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, um, she actually last year posed that question to me. Who is Catherine Anaya? Who, who, who is she to the viewer? And I thought, is this a trick question? <laughs> um, but she said, when I, when I see Catherine Anaya, she speaks community, she speaks passion, and she speaks um, somebody who very much believes in where she came from. So I thought, wow. That is essentially how I would describe myself. Um, and I think that those three things um, would probably be the things that have um, helped me achieve some longevity. I mean, never in a million years would I think I'd still be doing this and loving every minute of it 23 years later. So I, th I think that um, the fact that I get involved in the community really sets me apart. Um, and that is authentic, because if you strip away my job, I'm still going to be as, as involved tomorrow as I am today. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what qualities have kept me in the business, except maybe I've picked really good anchor men to sit next to me. <laughs> um, you'd have to ask my coworkers. I will just say that I, I try to be sincere when I interview people, that, um, so they forget that they're going to be on the news that night, because I'm really interested in what they have to say and that when I tell their story, I don't try to dress it up or make them sound a different way or slant the story to make them either more important than they are or less important than they are. So I would just say that I just try to be um, the person you would bump into at Safeway. And have. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I go there a lot. <laughs> You know, I'm just a really curious person about life. I'm just really curious about people I meet. And I also just get bored really easily. So I don't think I would have been able to take a, a desk job, per se. Not that there's anything wrong with a desk job. My grandfather is a heart surgeon. My family is, has a medical background. And boy, was he disappointed when I made that phone call, Emilio Pena. And I said, I think I'm going to go to broadcasting school. What, do you want to be an actress? No, <laughs> no, Papu, I want to go into broadcasting. It's actually credible, legitimate. To this day, I still think he thinks I'm on a Spanish soap opera somewhere. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he understands what I'm doing. But I will just tell you guys that I, I just think it's fun, right? It's interesting. And interesting to me is fun. And I'm just a really curious person. So that is what has really given me a lot of flight. Um, and I've, I've been really fortunate. No day is ever the same. Yeah, no, that's, that's not, what it is. It's a great, it, it's a phenomenal gig. Well, and, and I have to tell you on that note really fast, because these, some days are schizophrenic. Uh, don't put that on Twitter. Don't, that's, not, <laughs> that's not a good quote to attribute. Too late. But I will tell you, Friday, you, you never know what's going to happen. Friday, I walked in. My co-anchor was off. First, I had a break in doing weather. I was getting ready to host a, a debate about medical marijuana and a segment on Syria. And then Deborah Milkey, the death row inmate, gets out and they go, get on set, you have to do the Deborah Milky, she's getting out. So that just gives you like dust storms, rain, death row inmate, Syria, medical marijuana, <laughs> all within an hour and a half. And right? then go home during your dinner break and be a referee. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is. Can I, uh, sense of humor. 
Yes. Sense of humor, you. and I'm not afraid to hug people who need a hug, yeah. <laughs> whether they know they need it or not. <laughs> no, I'm, I try to keep things light when appropriate. Um, not in a mean way, but I just try to take the high road and be, and I, there are obviously some things you can't look at and laugh at, but I think that most things you can and I'm always looking for that. I, it may not come out in my stories all the time, but uh, in the newsroom, You're very just... real. You're a very oh, real you. person. Thank you. Yeah. Some of you talked about Twitter. Some of you talked about social media. Some of you talked about, is TV even going to be here in a couple of years? That sort of thing. But how do you feel your job, your role in the newsroom, your role as a community leader, how are these things changing as the industry changes for you? Well, it's a big part of our job now. I mean, it is a big part of our job. Um, somebody in here is interviewing me for one of their classes, and we um, uh, emailed earlier. And I was saying that um, you know, I have Twitter, um, LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, um, what am I forgetting, Google+, Facebook. Um, and those don't even include my personal ones. Um, they expect us, and when I say they, I mean it's part of our job, is that you need to be posting on a regular basis, and that's not even including the station Facebook page. So it takes up a very big chunk of our time that I don't think people realize. Um, and while some days it gets to be a little bit too much because you also have you know, the J Jody Arias verdict happening, and oh, by the way, you need to be tweeting about it and posting about it. Um, but I think it's a really valuable thing because it's allowed us to connect with our viewers in a way that we've never been able to do before. Instant feedback. Um, I just think it's really important for us to have that relationship with our viewers to where they can feel that, that they know us. Because um, I think that if you talk to most people, you know, they'll probably look at all of the stations and think, well, they all seem to have the same news. But I watch Channel 12 because I like Lynn Sue or I watch Channel 5 because my kids go to Catherine's kids' school. I mean, it, it comes, sometimes it just comes down to what they know about you outside of the newsroom. And so that's really important for us to have that relationship with our viewers. Social media is huge, and it is changing. I mean, we don't, there, there isn't breaking news anymore because it's on Twitter. It, it's so instantaneous. Um, and if you tweet something like five minutes later, you get people telling you, oh, this is old news. <laughs> it's so, yes, it's so instant. And it's, uh, in fact, there's a student in here that I'm meeting with who's doing um, a project, a thesis on Twitter. Um, I think we're meeting next week. Uh, she has had tracked different um, broadcasters around the country, their Twitter accounts and how many tweets they tweet out and how it affects um, what they do at the station and maybe what they're doing uh, in terms of are they the first or second or third ranked rated station in their market. Uh, I'm really not sure all the things she's doing. I'm kind of interested to find out. But that is how it, it's become a thesis project. That's how Twitter has come from really what is tweeting to everybody knows what it is and everybody has an account and everybody's checking it constantly. And I don't even know what it's going to be like when you guys are ready to graduate. It's exciting and scary at the same time. Well, I mean, I've only been anchoring for a few years. Oh, she's um, the Twitter queen of all no, of us, by the way. But I remember. You are. Um, you are. You know, I mean, I just want to tell you guys, like, it's sitting up here with these guys. They're just such amazing ladies, and I respect all of them so much. So it's just a beautiful thing to be at this next level in my career now. But I remember when I was first uh, started anchoring a couple years ago, and, you know, you'd fill in and whatever. And so um, Tess went out on maternity leave, and they had me doing the weekend show. Anyways, my boss at the time, my, our old news director, I, I went on Twitter on my own, and I was like, oh, I, this is cool, because I like the connectivity. I like that Twitter forces us in the media to keep it real, to not pretend like something is breaking or a bigger deal if it isn't. I, I like that. And I like when people call you out. A lady tweeted me the other day. She goes, it seems like you're blinking a lot. What? I thought, you know what, I am kind of tired. Maybe I do need some Visine. So I mean, those things don't bother me. So. I started tweeting, and my boss, I remember he came over and he goes, what is this, you know how older people, they call it all the wrong things, like for the longest time, they're like twerking and tweeting and blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm like, it's called Twitter, and he's like, oh, it's a waste of time, walked away. I'm like, okay, we'll see who's a waste of time. <laughs> About six months later, sure enough, our station gets a memo, every person has to have their own account. By that time, I already had had, you know, built up, 
thousands of followers. Um, and so... And by the way, that news director is gone, and Carrie's still here. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against him. So he, just, he was an old school news director. And this is just the new way of media. I mean, if you don't like people, you're probably not going to do well in this business. Because gone are the days where you know you can go in in your pristine suit and nobody ever sees you, and you just look at the camera and that's it. And you're like, okay, I'm out. Dinner break. So now, it did just you guys all just tweet that she's twerking? <laughs> <laughs> then my boss will take notice yeah. of what I'm doing over at ASU tonight. That's funny. <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, I was very intimidated by it in the beginning. I was resistant to it. I thought it was enough that I could walk and talk at the same time and point to flames, and I was this solid writer. And I'm like, really? Really? Something else? I already do Facebook. What do you want from me? And now I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking I should check it. No, I, I really like it. I am. Um, and I believe that, as you said, we are now not just we all have the same stories, but we now are sharing cameras and helicopters. And yes. so you are basically going to see the same pictures of the same stories on different stations. So as you said, it's that connection. And it's the tiny stuff, the people who tweet, I saw you at Safeway, but I didn't want to say hi. And I get to say back, come up and say hi for crying out loud. You know, say hi. It's, it's no big deal. Now I know we all shop at Safeway. <laughs> Just don't ask us for our address and the names of our kids. Yeah. But you can say hi. <laughs> but you know, not to, not to take anything away from credibility, OK? Because obviously, that is key to longevity. But it's true, Linda. I mean, it's, it's, I can't tell you how many times people have said, thank you so much for responding or thank you so much for responding so quickly. I think sometimes they think they're going to get an assistant or they're not going to get a response at all. And it's just, mm -hmm. it, it's, in my opinion, it's my way of saying thank you because I wouldn't have a job if you didn't watch. Yeah, well said, well said. There you go. <laughs> I just want to note, I shop at the same Safeway, and I think it's hysterical because they won't say it in front of you guys, but they don't know who I am. And I'm just like, and I hear them talk, and they're like, oh, did you see what she put in her basket? Did you, so, <laughs> did you think she's making cookies with her kids tonight? I mean, it's, it's crazy. It that it, but I think exactly what you're talking about, the accessibility factor, when it used to be just people seeing people through this magical screen, and people can reach through the screen and there can be give and take, and it's changing the industry, not just for anchors, but for everybody that's going to work in a newsroom. You are going to become your own identity, and it's, you have to be in charge of that identity um, every single moment of every single day. Viewers don't have to call and leave a message with the assignment desk and wait for you to call back the next day. They just go to Twitter or Facebook and talk to you now. Well, and on that note, for all of you guys, I mean, it, you can literally get in touch with some of the biggest news directors in the business right there on Twitter. A lot of times, Twitter sort of removes the formality of the situation. And I know several news directors in Los Angeles, even some folks at CNN, who, if you start following them on Twitter, build up a rapport, you could interact with them. And that's a great thing, a strategy for you guys as you build up your brand, no matter which direction you're going to go. Uh, it's important to brand yourselves now and build on that brand, and Twitter is a perfect way to do that. Oh, yeah. Speaking of building the brand, now's your chance. Okay, journalism students, where are your questions? <laughs> Let's turn it over to you. I know we have some eager people out there, so when the microphone comes your way, please say who you are, where you're from, where you are in your Cronkite experience, and um, go ahead and ask your question. Miss Megan is coming her way. I'm Maddie Hyman. I'm a freshman, and I'm from Surprise, Arizona, so I've watched all of you guys on TV for, like, my whole life. Oh, thank you. Um, so what is the most interesting story that you guys have covered? Like, that you feel the most, like, I know Year Now was a big thing for all of you guys. It was a big thing for me, too. And I wasn't even in Arizona at the time. And so what is the biggest story, besides from Year Now, that has impacted you the most or has inspired you the most? I have a couple well, of responses. Yeah. yeah, a couple of responses. Go for it. Yep. <laughs> the most interesting? Uh, I, 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 I would be lame if I said it's the one I did at noon today. But every, <laughs> no, every story should be 
a challenge like that. I mean, I was standing in a nursery and it was pouring on my head and my raincoat doesn't work. I found out the hard way, it just soaks right through. So, yeah, I, I can't lead with that. They can't toss to me and I start bitching about my raincoat. But that's what, the, that was what was at top of mind. So how do I somehow convey that this is a big storm? And um, first words out of my mouth were, you guys know what, I'm a desert rat. I'm used to, it comes in, boom, it moves out. This is a Midwest, this is an East Coast kind of storm. It's got staying power. And so, I'm, and so I just spoke from the heart about rain. I'm not a meteorologist, but I would be if I thought about it. <laughs> but I'm not. But I get back to the station and everyone talks about how great that live hit was. And it was me standing in a nursery talking for one minute. And I was trying to figure out what made it so great, and it was probably because I didn't try too hard. And I had one, real. I didn't have any video, all I had was a rain gauge. And I could say, you know what, Saturday morning it was at a half inch, now look at it, it's at an inch and a half. Wow, that's a lot of, you know, basic. <laughs> but you know. for, yeah, so basic, but somehow, everybody felt that, what is well, up with here's that? Here's what I love, is you asked what the most important story, and I think Linda's, showing you that um, we could all say we interviewed presidents or presidents' wives or the Pope or we movie stars or, I, you know, I had lunch with Jay Leno or whatever. None of that ever comes into your mind as the greatest story you've ever done. What you remember are this crossing guard who was paralyzed and he lived in a mobile home and he couldn't get to his wheelchair so he would get on, he would you know, come off the couch on his butt and he would scoot down the steps of his mobile home and then scrape his bottom across gravel and then lift himself up in his wheelchair and wheel to the crossing guard and help these children get across safely. And somebody said, can somebody build him a ramp so he can just wheel his wheelchair into the house and be, you know, get into his own house? So we called volunteers and Home Depot donated and the crossing guard kids came and they painted it and all these construction companies came and they didn't just build a ramp that went from the street across the gravel that he used to scrape his legs up on. They built a complete ramp that went all the way around the Mahomo and then they built a patio, a deck, so he could come out and eat his dinner and watch the sun go down and he had a little patio. And I was crying because these little kids love this crossing guard. None of them knew what he had to go through every day to get to that intersection. So those are the stories that stick in your head. Are they the most important? I don't know. Well, yes. and, and it, it was the most important to him. Yeah. So I think it's like, what's an important story? It depends on what's the most important to right. them. Yeah. Oh, I have that's no, a great no idea story. what I asked the president. It's just whatever the st story was of the day, and it doesn't stick with you. Well, yeah. it is what I like to say is extraordinary, or ex ordinary people doing extraordinary things, yes. I think is what Cares. The not-for-profit hospice cares for all, do. regardless. Uh-oh. <laughs> 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 President Obama expected to address the nation tomorrow night. Is it Siri? <laughs> no. um, when, when you recognize the power of television and that you can really impact people's lives by just a story that you tell, it, it turns out it's not just a story, but you inspire people, you motivate them, you tell somebody's story and you, and you you know, you raise them up to a different level than, than people may have seen them before your story. I, I just think that that, for me, is the most rewarding thing of what we do. Other questions? Oh, boy. Wow. <laughs> Front row. Hi, I'm Chelsea Bayarte from Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm a freshman. It's like my third week of school ever. Oh. And my question for you guys is, male or female, who do you still look up to to this day? What are your journalistic role models, past or present, that really get you to continue doing what you do? Mary Jo West. Mm. You know, she was the first, first wasn't she? She was the first woman broadcaster. She worked with Bill Close. Blonde, adorable. I was a freshman at ASU, living in Tempe, and I would go in the bathroom with a tape recorder and sit there and read the newspaper out loud, trying to sound like her. Mm. 
Don't do that. You I know. So when you said don't do that, I'm like, gee, it kind of worked out for me. <laughs> but you are yourself. You are your own person. I, I am myself. You are your that, own person. But that is how I started. That's how I started. You went in the bathroom and acted like a cute blonde. Yes. <laughs> well, no. Don't that was that. the beauty of her. She didn't act like a cute blonde. She just was. But um, I mean, that's, and she's the one who made me think I could do that. I remember. The very first story I did at Fox 10, she, Channel 10, we were CBS then, she tossed to it. It was a story about Coke memorabilia. And she said, Linda Williams reports that there's a lot of Coke memorabilia and a lot of fans downtown. I get home, I walk into my house, my parents, my sister's there, and I'm like, did you see it? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, what do you think? And they were like, Mary Jo West said your name. <laughs> <laughs> Said, did you see the part where I was on TV and I talked about, they're like, yeah, but she said your name. <laughs> I mean, so it was that kind of That's thing. That's a great story. Yeah, oh, it's great. true. It's fun. All right, next. Let's get with somebody maybe over here. Find a gentleman. Oh, there you go. Hello, my name is Tyler Sudarth. I'm a transfer student at ASU. I'm really excited to be here. My question is, there's a lot of opportunity coming here. There seems like there's so many things that I'm into and that I really like. But I was wondering, like, I'm kind of nervous at the same time to kind of get out there, even though I'm afraid to admit it. How do you handle, when you first started, like, any pressure or anxiety, especially being in front of a camera or anything, how would you handle that? And what did you do to push past it? Well, as someone who started in this market, who perhaps should not have started in this market, I can tell you that you just have to go out there and do it. Really, television is about learning on the fly. And here's the thing, you have to educate yourself. Because what I have found is that, and my news director told me this at the time, he goes, listen, you can figure out how to be on TV, but no one can teach you how to be smart. You know what you're talking about, going back to the writing. I had the foundation, you know. Boy, did I have a couple of really bad live shots where the photographer was behind the camera like this. Rap, rap. And the longer, you, the more nervous you get, the more yeah. keep talking you do, and it's just a, a horrendous train crash. But that's okay, that's okay. The bottom line is, is that if you know what you're talking about and you're interested in it, then that will show through. And I think, I mean, you got it, you're a good looking guy, make it happen. <laughs> Right? Wow. Oh, that's right. something to tweet. tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you want to go to another question? Hi, my name is Serena, and I live in Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm a freshman at Cronkite. And my question would be that normally when we see you guys on the news, that's all we see, and we don't see the busy work that goes into it when you're not on air. And I was just wondering if you can give us an insight on what you typically do when you're not on air that goes into the preparation when you are working on air. I always love it when people come to shadow us because I think they walk in with this false impression that we just slide onto the set, read somebody a teleprompter. Does your hair yes, your somebody makeup. does your hair, makeup, you read the teleprompter and you're done. Not the case at all. Um, I don't know how your days are, but I get in 1.45, 2 o'clock, I go straight to an editorial meeting. We're in there usually till 2.30. Then I come out and I start recording promos, usually close to 3 o'clock. I'm obviously trying to get on social media because if I'm being true to my separate work and personal life, I haven't been on yet. Um, so I'm trying to at least post something, return you know, other people's interactions, what have you, my emails. Um, that usually takes me up to about 3.30. And then at 3.30 is when I have to start prepping for the 5 o'clock news um, because it's an hour newscast. And so I'm very diligent about reading my scripts because I don't like to read copy cold. Um, you'll find that Everybody writes differently, and so um, some people know your style and how you speak, and you don't have to change a single thing. And there are other people who don't, and you have to go in there and massage scripts, and that takes time, looking for factual errors, if there are any, what have you. Um, and then at 4.30, I have to go into the restroom, because no, I don't have somebody to do my makeup or my hair, and so I have to take care of that myself. And, and that takes me all the way up through 6 o'clock, okay, through the newscast. Meanwhile, in commercial breaks, I'm going ahead to the 6.30 newscast, because we only have a very short turnaround between 6 and 6.30. Um, 6.30 comes around, we do that newscast, 7 o'clock. If it's a Monday or Tuesday, it takes me usually till about 7.30 to get home. 
and then I am knee deep in homework and dinner, referee sometimes, um, trying to make sure that I'm controlling the chaos that usually happens. Um, and then I'm zooming back to work at about a quarter to nine. I get in usually about 9, 10, 9, 15, and I'm right back out my scripts again um, to get ready for the 10. And I'm usually there on those nights because I haven't been able to return emails or do all of the busy stuff that I should be doing because I'm home. I usually make up for it on the back end because I know the kids are asleep and so I can stay at work till 12, 12.30. So I usually am there on Mondays and Tuesdays till about 12.30 in the morning. And that's the work routine. What that does yeah. not take into account is <clears throat> something like this between your shows. Yep. You know, you're not doing what you would normally be doing because you're making an appearance or going to work before you get to work, you're emceeing an event. Or on a Saturday night when you're off, you're emceeing a four-hour charity event. Or they tell you, oh, we're doing a special show, so at 9 o'clock every Sunday night through football season, you're going to be reading an hour and a half of news. Or, as they did a couple weeks ago, we've got both senators coming in and they've agreed to do a town hall on immigration. So you're going to work the 10 and then you need to get up in the morning and drive to Mesa Arts Center so we can do rehearsals with lighting and stuff. And then the next day you need to be there for the town hall before you start your day at work. So those are the things that get thrown in. Election night, you stay as late as it takes. Yeah. A plane goes down in Indian School Park and broadcasters are killed. <laughs> you are going to stay and you're going to do that. So breaking news, that doesn't, or you're, you're going to have to go out of town because 19 firefighters died and you have to figure out what to do with your kids for four days because I have a husband who travels. So that's the chaos that you don't see on the daily chaos. So you really, you really don't know when we say it's unpredictable what tomorrow holds because we don't know what catastrophic thing is going to happen. She's like, I don't want to be in broadcast I know, it's like, <laughs> not to discourage you. You have to love what you do. <laughs> and you have to juggle. You have to love what you do and you have to juggle. And you have to, you were talking about, you know, I don't know what to do. You just do your best. That's all you do is you do your best. Nobody out there, I hope none of you expect us to be perfect. Because in our day-to-day -day conversations, we flub words. You're talking so here. fast, right? <laughs> and nobody goes, oh, she made a mistake and she pronounced that wrong. You just keep going and you smile because you're real. What you're saying is more important than how you got it out sometimes. And people at home want the information so they're paying attention and they are into what you're presenting, not necessarily how flawlessly every single night you present it. Obviously you don't want to be, you know, mispronouncing things left and right, but it happens. We're and human. You, right, you just go on. But I will tell you with social media, if you make one mistake, boy, they are on you yeah. right away. To be <laughs> right there to point it out. And what I've discovered is if I point it out before they do, and I make light of it, they go easier on me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good strategy. Speaking of yes. mistakes, yeah. you can't be late for work, yeah, my which Carrie has, has to, oh, has to go it's because she has to be bye. on the air soon. So we'll see her in a second. <laughs> Don't be late for your job, rule number oh, yeah. one, right? <laughs> Show up early, be there yes. early. All right, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah, I think we can get one or two in. Okay. Let's Make Let's them see. good, Megan. Let's get another gentleman question. I'll stand up, because everyone else did. I'm Joey Hardy. I'm from Gilbert, Arizona. And um, my question is, I mean, obviously, journalism's a competitive field, and you guys are from three different news networks. And I was just curious what the, maybe it isn't competition, but the competition between you guys, or maybe how you work together or stick together, or what that's like, you know? Well, if you've been around long enough, you've worked with each other at some point or another, or you've met each other somewhere and exchanged pediatrician suggestions. I think that's how you and I met yes. um, years ago when, when yeah. before my daughter was born, and now she's yeah. almost 17. Wow. Um, can you believe it's been that long? Mine's a sophomore at U of A. <laughs> don't throw things. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Lynn Sue and I worked together in the 90s. I mean, you just... If you don't know each other personally, you have friends or coworkers or, you know, we're all six degrees of separation. And not every market will be this kumbaya oh, yeah. type yes. of attitude. Oh, and yeah. not everyone in this market feels that way. There are markets that we say they have sharp elbows, no. which means, you know, when we all want a shot most of the time, and it's a shot, let's say, the governor or the president's coming out of a door, We'll say, okay, line up. You get over there, you get over there. And we work it out amongst ourselves so that we all get the shot. We're not with the elbows and the, you go to some markets, you go to uh, a Detroit, 
you go to a New York, you go to some of these other markets, and you're going to have to do battle. You're going to have to be a witch sometimes to get the story. Rhymes with witch, you know what I mean. But be, ca <laughs> but, uh, you, but you, you do have to be careful too that you don't. Um, bruise anybody too badly because, again, I go back to you just never know who you're going to end up working exactly. with. Exactly. I think, you know, there are markets that are brutal and backstabbing, um, but I would rather be the stabby than the stabber because I think people see right through that. If you are doing your job and helping others and, I mean, the only reason you would be a witch with a bee is that you're insecure. I gotta be first, I gotta be first, I gotta be the only. Well, you're not going to be that much ahead of the next guy because he's right next to you, okay? And you're all gonna have the same lead story that night. And if you conduct yourself with grace and, grace and poise, you get that paid back in spades. And you deserve to be there, there. There's no reason to be a jerk in the field. And there's no reason that I can't like these ladies and still want to do really good on the story. That's right. I, I would hope my writing would be better. I would hope my pictures that the photographer got were better. But it's not the end of the world if it isn't, and it's not going to affect how I feel about them. But that's your decision. You have to decide how you want to be. It is. Take the high road. It's always the best always. road to take. But. No, never mind. <laughs> but I want to win every night. I've seen markets where oh, things yeah. were dicey, yeah, and Dallas I was, was like, horrible. you get in there, sister, and you get your mic in there, and you tell them you were there first, and, you know, I don't know. I, I hope it doesn't come to that. It'd be nice if, you, if we could all have a market like this where we cooperate with one another, but I fear that might not be the case. We'll see. Tweet right. about it if it right. happens. Well, I mean, you can still try to scoop the competition. You, do, you should want to do that. All the time. Um, but you shouldn't be... Uh, it doesn't have to be nasty. Lying to them and being... Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's not necessary. All right, final competition. Last question of the Ooh. night. Uh -oh. We've got a fast yeah. question. We have two minutes. Fast? Oh, okay. Fast question. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, so we really fast. I'm Cameron Stevenson, senior transfer student. Oh. Um, Shoot. Uh, <laughs> you said fast. <laughs> um, okay. So for someone trying to get, you know, after they graduate and they want to get a job, if they have a market they want to get into, like if, say I wanted to go into Phoenix, should I specifically just try and get into the Phoenix market or should I try anywhere I can get a job? Well, that answers that. Anywhere you can get a job. <laughs> okay. Yep. And coming out of the Cronkite School... I you will get a you job. Get, you, you're going to get an inroad, okay? You guys have you're such great here. equipment here that when you go to your first job, you're going to go, seriously, that's yeah. your set? You have better stuff than we yeah. have, It okay? came from and Channel is, 12. Yeah. It's old, Channel 12's old stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's, you guys are spoiled. And that's a wonderful thing because then you know what you want. when You, you will be so far ahead of the competition yeah. when you get out there. Yeah. You're so tremendously lucky. Yeah. Take any job, young man, but start talking to the news directors in this market right now. Right. Young man, get an internship. Let them know who you are. Let them know who you are now. Apply but for take an internship. any job you get. But just, yeah, say, I just wanted to touch base before I go out into the world and let you know I will be back to kick. Yep. And they'll remember that. There you go. <laughs> Like you said, you all have new Twitter fans tonight. That's I'm right. sure all of these young faces will be following you <laughs> oh, in the weeks and years do. to Thank come. You. Thank, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.